Good evening, welcome to Villa Albertine. I am very happy to introduce a new museum tour, our series dedicated to French art and culture in American museums. Today, we are very honored to host Dr. Jonathan Binstock, director and CEO at the Philips Collection, and Elsa Sisdal, uh, chief curator, for a talk on the currently uh, displayed exhibit celebrating Pierre Bonnard at the Philips Collection. Both of them today will be in discussion with our great moderator, Faya Kose. Faya is a scholar and educator whose interests range in era from the Paleolithic to the present. She started her career as the professor of art history in California and recently retired as the head of academic program at the National Gallery of Art in uh, DC. Uh, although her primary field is ancient art and her best known books are on amber, she has also published on Jana, German modernist Sigmund Freud, and on Paul Cézanne. She continues to be involved in numerous cultural institutions, serving on local and national boards, among them the Archaeological Institute of America. Recently, she was elected as a member of La Société Paul Cézanne and also fellow of one of the oldest educational charities in the world, the Society of antiquaries of London. Jonathan, uh, Elsa, Faya, thanks a lot for hosting us in this wonderful museum today. And I leave you now the floor for this promising museum tour. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, Denise. It's a great pleasure to work with the Villa Albertine program of the Embassy of France on this museum talk series, number 15. This evening, what a pleasure to be here at the Phillips Collection, one of the museum jewels of DC and America's first museum of modern art. For the next hour, we will be in the galleries where is installed this special exhibition celebrating the French artist Pierre Bonnard. Loans of Bonnard's paintings from around the world, from both public and private collections, join paintings from the rich holdings of Bonnard at the Phillips. We will be welcomed by Dr. Jonathan Binstock, the Phillips Radenberg Director and CEO, and then head into the gallery to look at selected works with chief curator, Elsa Nestal. At the end of the tour, we will have time for questions. So please jot them down in the Q&A box. And now I'd like to welcome Jonathan Binstock, who has just celebrated his one year anniversary at the Phillips. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I am Jonathan Binstock, the Vradenberg Director and CEO of the Phillips Collection. We are delighted to welcome you to the Phillips Collection this evening. Uh, we have a special in gallery tour for you. Uh, while we have been, uh, we have partnered with the French Embassy for decades in so many ways, and we are very grateful for that partnership. This is the first time we will uh, implement or uh, execute on a live feed from the Phillips Collection as a tour uh, for you of our galleries. Uh, you're in for a treat because the exhibition is Bonnard's World. Uh, Pierre Bonnard, uh, we consider him to be. Uh, fundamental to our collection and, uh, and who we are as an institution. This is the first time in 20 years that Bonnard is having a retrospective exhibition here in Washington, D.C. And, and that's important to note because this is the place where he should be having such an exhibition. We have, I think it's fair to say, the finest collection of Bonnard in the country. And uh, we are Bonnard's home away from home here in the U.S. We were the first museum to acquire his work. Our founder, Duncan Phillips, was a great champion of Bonar. Uh, he was also uh, given his first solo museum exhibition show in the United States here at the Phillips. So you're in for a treat. And uh, let me just say thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoy the evening. Thanks to the French Embassy as well for their ongoing friendship and partnership. Uh, and with that, thank you very much.
And now, it's my pleasure to introduce Elsa Smithgall, Chief Curator at the Phillips and Co-Curator with George Shackelford of the Kimball Art Museum in Fort Worth of this remarkable exhibition. Throughout her distinguished career at the Phillips Collection, Elsa has contributed to numerous publications, initiatives, and exhibitions centered on her specialty in modern American and European art. In the past decade alone, she's directed over a dozen critically acclaimed special exhibitions. And now to her most recent project, Bonard. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be with you all this evening, uh, to give you a glimpse, if you haven't yet entered the galleries of Bonard's world. This is a rare moment um, where we've brought together 58 paintings by Bonard from across the United States and around the world. Um, and so what a treat to spend this time with you. We're going to speak about just a few of the highlights um, in, in the exhibition. Our exhibition begins with these incredibly luscious landscapes and garden scenes, such as the terrace. And in this case, we're looking at one of the majestic paintings in the Phillips collection, um, the terrace from 1918, and this is in fact uh, a scene set in Bonnard's home at the time um, in Vernon, the Normandy that he acquired in 1912, and that he saw as a wonderful refuge from Paris, from the city. Uh, and this particular painting um, really speaks to this idea of surrendering to nature. Um, if I may quote Bonnard, he talked very much about how in front of nature, you could be so overwhelmed and so consumed that for him it was important to, to get out in nature, but then to come back to his studio and uh, paint uh, away from nature, allow himself to look at the, refer to the little sketches that he might have made on his daily walks, but to come back um, to the studio and paint from memory. And in a way, for him, it's all about capturing that immediate sensation he felt before nature. So this picture um, allows us to get a feeling for the way that Bonar thought about nature. It was uh, something he relished it in its most pure, uncultivated form. So this is a picture that at one time was called Le Jardin Sauvage. So the wild, savage garden. So you can see in the beautiful massing of the foliage and the trees here, um, the energy um, that he, um, he that is exuded here in the in the in the picture. And then within it, if you look a little closer, nestled between these two trees, uh, you, particularly maybe your eye will catch the, the vibrant orange of the woman's dress. And there she is with a gentleman here, cradled there within nature, so perfectly married in, in, in nature. But clearly, what's taking center stage for Bonar is the, the majesty of this setting. And he invites us in. We're here standing on the terrace where he clearly is showing himself implied, his presence. We get to kind of um, bring ourselves into this beautiful scene. There's a tray with some fruit um, um, ready for us to take a bite um, and, and really become one with this scene. I would like to say the other thing that this suggests is that um, the setting here allows us to realize some of the circle of artists that Bonar was so close with because his good friend was Monet. And Monet's home was just across the Seine River here um, and so they were frequently visiting one another. And one might see, feel a sense in the, the, the lovely violet and green palette, in those beautiful um, arabesque curved strokes of paint. You might feel a sense of the influence of Monet. But Bonnard, unlike the Impressionists, did not paint on plein air in front of nature, as I said. Um, and was not thinking about color from a naturalistic point of view, but rather from a way of expressing feelings 
um, through, through the, the choices of color in a very intuitive way. And that was something that really was what drew someone like Duncan Phillips to his work. I think that one of the things you're going to see as we move through the exhibition is the way that this, this idea of um, Bonar um, as someone who was taking in many different environments um, comes to mind because even though this painting represents Normandy in the north, he carried the memory of being in the south to the north, to going through Paris with him. He would roll up the canvases on top of his car and, and you know, keep working on them no matter where he may be. So for this period of time until he really settles permanently in Le Canet, in the home he will buy there in 1926, um, he's moving very freely. Uh, he'll settle there permanently rather in 1939, but he buys the house there in 1926. But I feel like what you're starting to feel is that for him when he discovers the beauty of light, it's going to have a transformative effect. And here I was thinking of that because you can see the, the way that he's integrating in that foreground area with the beautiful orange tones, the shadows that are being cast in this sun-drenched landscape. We're going to move next into the joining gallery. Uh, and we're going to look, turn now to one of the earlier works in the exhibition uh, that is made in 1892 and allows us to also look at another setting, another garden um, that was so important to Bonnard. In this case, we're in southeastern France, in the Dauphiné, um, in the home that was a fam longtime family home for Bonnard called Le Grand Long. And we're looking here at a scene in which Bonnard's own family becomes important. And, it, and we, we, he, we see Bonnard is not in the scene himself, so we feel his presence here. He's clearly taken this in. Um, and what he's showing us is a wonderful twilight scene um, that is suggested by the beautiful um, cloud-like formations at the upper right in yellow. Um, but we're, we're looking at the, the family members enjoying a game of croquet. And this woman in the foreground here holding the mallet is Bonar's sister, Andre. And she had just wed two years before. The gentleman you see here on the far right, upper far right standing, Claude Torras, the musician and well-known composer of the day, seated below Claude in this yellow straw hat is Bonar's father. Um, and in many of Bonar's pictures, we see pets, which he loved and adored. So you can see the dog to the, to the, right, to the left, rather, of Andre, and a figure here of a woman shown from behind who might be Bonar's cousin. Um, also invisible on the far right are a cluster of children dancing. So this, this image for me is full of lots of, of joy and life and exuberance. Um, and memories of, of these important moments where Bonar retreated to spend time with his family, himself not having had any children. He'll no, never end up having children of his own. Um, this is 1892, so the year before he'll meet his future right, wife, Mart. Um, and what I think you might notice that's particularly striking is the fact that the style at this time is pretty distinctive. And so at this moment, Bonnard is part of a circle of artists that includes someone like Edward Bouillard, Maurice Denis, Félix Vallaton, who call themselves the Nabi, which is the Hebrew word for prophet. And they are ushering in, as prophets, a new way of making art that is freed from having to be about slavish description of the, of the real world, the physical qualities of the real world. And that essentially, they embrace an idea that they get from Gauguin, that essentially art is a flat surface arranged with colors in a certain order. And you get the flat feeling here, very much so, more so than in the previous picture, perhaps, because they delight in really playing with the decorative qualities of the surface and the beautiful 
patterning that you see, particularly in the dress of these individuals. Um, and one of the other things that they're inspired by is Japanese art. So Bonar collected Japanese yukioi prints. On the studio wall in his home in Makane, he had a reproduction of a Hiroshige print. Um, and he was so taken with it, there was a huge craze for Japanese ma in Paris at this time. It was widely exhibited and available. Uh, and one can also almost imagine this composition like a folding Japanese screen. And Bonar was also making Japanese screens simultaneous to this moment in time. And so I think that that idea comes to mind for me as I really take this scene in and, and really appreciate um, the, the aspects that he has come up with. Especially another thing that's notable is that there is, in this particular composition, a real incredible range of the way that green is figured in. But there's just the modulations from lighter to dark are quite, quite something, and, and how he can create such expression, again, within a more limited tonal palette in this case. This setting was also um, the inspiration for several other paintings. And we do have in this exhibition a, another painting um, that was done 10 years later nearby. And uh, so I encourage you all to have a chance to come and, and, and enjoy them. And even to the right, there's a child playing in, in the garden that is thought to be, again, inspired by this wonderful setting of Le Grand Mont. So let's take a look. Um, you know, we, we saw Ma Roulat, which translates to my caravan. Um, and that re sort of idea of the wandering, the wandering Bonar. Um, we're going to wander to the open window, which is also a scene set at the home in Ma Roulat. And I want to say that we are really fortunate to be able to be feasting our eyes on a painting that was restored specifically for this exhibition. It is going to be worth your while to come see it in person because there had been a varnish put on in the 1980s and it remained on this painting ever since. And uh, our conservators were able to remove that varnish and a varnish really dulls the colors and it also really um, makes the, the textural qualities of the surface of those strokes really not so uh, expressive. Um, and, uh, and this has been a, just a huge transformation um, that, that we are allowed to feast our eyes on here. Uh, what you're noticing, if you take in this scene, is that Bonar had a lot of fun playing with this idea of the window as a motif. Um, the way that it allows you to think about bringing together inside and outside. Was that a new motif? Absolutely not. I mean, there is certainly a whole long history to the Renaissance with the use of the window and the way that that can almost sort of conjure as a metaphor this imagined other realm, okay, outside of one's real life. But in fact, for Bonar, he is, like he is with all the work, using his own lived experiences as a point of departure and filling all of the surfaces here. Where is your eye going in this picture? Um, I think what's so fascinating is the way that for Bonar, there can often be something really fun to discover on the periphery of those paintings. So I encourage everyone to spend time, you might miss something, if you whiz by and don't really take a moment and linger and allow your eye to roam around every edge of the composition. Because what is then very innovative for Bonar is decentering the action. That often, I, um, instead of a, a sort of single point vanishing perspective and making what is the focus at the center, there's in his work an effort 
that to, to really allow yourself to, to look all over and discover, as I said, in this case, I want your eye to move towards the far right, an image hovering here. And the figure here is um, sitting on a chair. And what you might notice, we know that, again, these little creatures love to be a part of the scene. This, this cat has got the paw there rubbing against the hand of this woman sitting in the chair. The scene you're looking at, um, again, invites you to think about the way that he's using color to really br bring you out and in. So you have the beautiful, cool blue violets of the sky. There's some beautiful violets in the shadows of the tree. And then, in a very harmonious way, the, that violet hue continues in the back of the chair that you see here. So it allows you to kind of transition from outside to in, and then you continue to see the really incredible play of violets and orange, and the way that those colors create such a vibration um, is really something that is, is um, part of what I think makes his works have so much vitality. Before we go on, may I ask you, um, how long has this painting been in the Phillips collection? I thank you for that question. And in so far as the Phillips, of course, as, you know, has uh, an amazing collection of 17 oil paintings today by Pierre Bonnard and another 15 works on paper. With this painting, it entered the collection in 1930. When it came into the collection, it was just after Phillips gave Bonnard his first ever museum solo exhibition, and he had a dozen paintings at that time in the collection. And in 1931, he says that Bonnard is one of his favorite artists. And may I just make a plug for the book that accompanies the exhibition, because it's the cover as well. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you. Shall we move into the next room? OK. We have a, a final treat for you to look at one of Bonar's seminal bather paintings uh, in a wonderful array of works in this section. The painting that I'm looking at with you here shows a figure in, in full form in, in the bathtub in Bonnard's home in Le Canet, um, a figure that is likely inspired by Mart. What I want to also say is that this bathroom was added onto the house, uh, and you can see this in pictures for yourself. I also had the great pleasure of being able to have a tour of the house um, and see for myself. And when you, when you first notice that the tiles in this bathroom are white, and the tub is this white enamel, and all the furniture in the room is painted white, the walls, the, the ceiling, you realize that Bonar is allowing himself to orchestrate a symphony of color to, to capture these incredible feelings um, in a way that is clearly not simply the way that light was flooded into the room and creating this wonderful multicolored effect. Um, so there, that idea of the abstract quality is really coming through when you see the, the, the wonderful play of color. The form. Um, of, the, of Mart has this ethereal quality. Perhaps I might even say a very spiritual quality. And, I'm, and with that, I, I would suggest that um, knowing Bonar painted this first in 1941, the year before Mart dies, but comes back to finish this painting, continue to live with the painting, and finish the painting after her death in 1946, which is the year Bonnard dies, so it's one of the last works that he'll ever make. 
Uh, and so this is sort of a tour de force. This, these works, um, uh, I think, um, really represent um, the way that there is such emotional intensity in Bonar's work combined with um, an incredible uh, orchestration of color and the way that that um, allowed him to become such a seminal influence on the next generation and generation even still today. Being such a painter's painter, um, people really appreciating the way that he um, was able to sort of bring into the pictures um, that vessel of feeling um, and the layering of color, carving out a space with color to encapsulate um, those intangible feelings. One of the things Duncan Phillips talked about in his tribute to Bonar after his death was how in the art there was this springtime of renewal uh, and a feeling for a love of life. Um, Bonar's work really does continue to have that resonance and that legacy today. Um, we are, of course, now just about to usher in spring. Um, and so I think that it's a great, great time to really come and um, immerse yourself in Bonar's world. Since you have visited um, the, uh, the actual bathroom, how big is it? <laughs> That's also something very worth noting. Thank you for your question, because it's extremely modest, as you might expect. <laughs> um, and uh, so, again, the, there's just um, a transformation here in the, the sense that I think that his work um, can suggest. But he, he was very humble, um, and the whole house really has this modesty um, about it, but absolutely, you know, he, this was a bathroom that they added, and it did have two windows, so there was some light that would have been filtered through, um, but, but it is, it is um, in, this, in seeing it in these pictures, I would imagine, uh, for you as much as it has been for me, um, uh, you know, it feels larger than life. The one that's beside it is really kind of interesting as a counterpoint. And the reason is that I feel that here you have a body that's dissolved in the water. It's sort of literally, like I said, the sense of it um, being, being absolutely floating in the water. Whereas the, there are other nudes by Bonar, and this one is from MoMA's collection, that have a lot more three-dimensionality and plasticity that you can feel in the, in the form that also perhaps might make you think of an important other artist for, for Bonard, Degas, um, and even Renoir, um, and their nude uh, figures. And so, uh, you know, I think I forgot to mention one other detail, having been in the bathroom, and that is that the floor itself was blue and white with the diamond patterning, a linoleum floor. So in that case, <laughs> there is some evocation of the patterning that, that was there in the, in the room. Uh, and uh, one of the things about these works is that, um, uh, you know, again, that they're, they're um, very private, and we're really, again, seeing the way that Bonar didn't hesitate to um, really mine his own very intimate um, parts of his world and his life and his experience, um, and very courageously open them up for all of us. Elsa, we've had a number of questions about the various animals, but in particular with these two, um, with, I think it's a dachshund. Yes. And is it, and it's the same dachshund? Well, <laughs> tell us about that. So Bonar had a real love, um, and, and Mard, I'm sure, the, you know, the two of them, um, loved the dachshund. And so, uh, and they had cats. They loved the dogs and cats. But the dachshund was obviously a favorite breed. And so, um, I mean, they were part of a family. As I said, they, you know, they didn't have children. 
And I think that their animals were absolutely as much a part of the family as, as, as anyone. And I, you know, I think that it's, you know, they, I think that their presence here, you, you can see very directly. But sometimes, again, you might just see the little nose of the dog peering from the lower edges of the painting. So they're, they're, they're sometimes um, worth looking for. But they're very tender and very, um, uh, just very loving um, in part of, and really being a part of, of Bonar's work. We have another question, which is, you told us about the linoleum floor, but what about the tiles? I think I read that they were play like playoffs of, they're, and they were white? Why were they, why were they painted those colors? So they were a faience tile with a little dimple in the middle, all white. Um, there was, at the top, they were capped by a darker blue capping, but they really were, you know, from, from the from the floor to the capping, all a white color. Um, and so the idea that he is showing all of these, um, you know, multicolored uh, tones here um, is really about the way that he is channeling emotion and thinking about, he says, I will, I mean, I'm going to use color and, and manipulate color to um, express events, to make feeling intelligible. So that is really what it's about. And the other quote he says is that, you know, um, that he might tell lies for a greater universal truth. Thank you for that, Elsa. We're now going to go and um, ask you some more questions. Okay. And uh, we will be taking hopefully more questions from the Q and A. All right. Oh, okay. One of the things that was marvelous because you set up the tour that we had today is that we begin outside, looking on the terrace. And then we go to another part of the garden, a little more enclosed. Then we're inside <laughs> with the open window. And finally, we end up in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> so we're back outside again. And uh, you want to say something about what's behind, what's behind us here? Well, this is a scene of um, the view that Bonar would have had from his home, which was perched above the hilltops in Le, in Le Canet. Um, and the painting is in the exhibition. It's a Phillips Collection painting. And I, I just, I thought it would be a nice way here as the backdrop to invite people in. And this is the beginning of our exhibition. And there is a figure, um, a ghostly presence, again, at more, again, not at quite at the, mid, the center, but at the lower portion, there is that woman in the shadows of Violet, again, coming, appearing, holding an apple, beckoning us in. Um, with, with this, uh, of the ex exhibition paintings, it seems to be the only one with these arms of palms. And is that part of the way he frames our view? Absolutely. One of the things Bonard did talk about in the teens, after he'd gone to the south of France, and like many artists like Van Gogh and like Cezanne and Matisse, um, they're so consumed and, you know, so just enraptured by the south, south of France and the color. So what he said is, at that time, you know, I don't, I want to take a moment and I want to make sure that I'm not forgetting the importance of composition and the structure of composition so that I don't get carried away by color and lose that. Right. And I think in this case, those palm fronds, as you said, that really kind of caress us, um, are so elegant and so intentional because they do create just an, a really um, beautiful way of framing the view. Whether they were really there in that exact shape is probably another question. <laughs> now, also something else is, um, as in, uh, this exhibition has wonderful labels, not too much and not too little, but it's because right behind your head is the 
I'm not sure which um, flowering tree that is or bush, um, yellow. So if you could say something once again, because we have two beautiful paintings that you've selected that have mimosas on them. So yes, um, I didn't, because of our limitations, get to stop in front of the studio with bouquet of mimosas, which is one of my all-time favorites. <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, and, and it is something that Bonar made a point in, you know, when he was in his home in La Cane to plant the mimosa trees, to paint, plant olive trees, fig trees. So I think, you know, yellow was, he said, his favorite color. Um, one can never have enough yellow. And so um, the, that is certainly an aspect playing into the scene that we're seeing the backdrop for here in, in the palm in, in, a, in a really quite beautiful way. But at the same time, again, I, I think that the, the violets, um, you know, as much as I, you know, I think the yellow is so, is so inviting, I also find the violets yes. um, quite evocative and um, dreamy, you know, in, 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 um, in, in, in many ways throughout. I would like another question that I had, as I would have had when I've been walking through the galleries, are people who are fascinated by the fact that they had gardens and um, what kind of gardens were they? One person said they seem a little on the overgrown side. Is that true? <laughs> yes, and uh, as we saw at the, at the very first painting, Bonard did like to let, let nature be seen in its, in its true natural form, so to speak. So he intentionally had gardens full of wild plants and flowers um, that he um, didn't necessarily feel the need to cultivate in the way Giverny, for example, <laughs> was so much, you know, the opposite of that. Um, and um, Bonar's love of gardens, it's a good way, if I could, just briefly also suggest that one of the other artists who loved gardens was Jennifer Bartlett. Yes. And we have a one-room, beautiful exhibition that is um, called In and Out of the Garden, um, that has scenes from the in the garden series, which she made um, from a time she was staying in southern France in Nice, not far from Bonnard. Um, and when was this again? So that is um, our show is in it just it's it's simultaneous with this exhibition. And when did and, she make them? Uh, those pictures were made in the later 20th century. I mm -hmm. can't recall the exact year. Right. But it's a wonderful But it's a wonderful correspondence. Sorry, I'm blanking on that, yes. That's all right, doesn't matter. Um, another um, question is because you brought up Monet and it was wonderful when you um, showed us, you know, here's the view and just across, just across the Seine is um, Monet and Giverny. Um, and I think that in, in, the, in the book, which I'll discuss in just a second with you, um, there is a sketch of Monet um, and um, bon oh, connected with Bonar. Could you just say a few more words? Did they talk a lot together, or did they, how did their gardens differ? Well, I think that um, one of the things that's interesting is that, um, yes, I mean, there, there are, there, whereas where Bonar and some of the other artists exchange letters, I think because they lived in proximity, there aren't a published yeah. body of letters <laughs> to, to know what they were saying to each other, to be honest with you, whereas Matisse, we are, you know, right. we have that. Um, but um, I do think that um, the way that, one thing that's really interesting about them that they share, I mean, that, they're, that the idea that, that Monet also really comes back to um, those water lilies, comes back again and again, um, and is, is um, um, continuing to, to, to look for uh, a way to, to express the, the, his, his, his feelings before nature. Um, they, there's got to have been, you know, we think of Bonar too, kind of that restless search to continue to kind of, you know, re return to works that he right. felt like, you know, he was all kind of in a, in a you know, similarly, that sort of... Um, there is that of sort of that, that ceaseless desire to kind of, you know, find a way, you know, searching for that perfect way to express oneself. 
that I think that is something that would have been um, a, a common calling for them. Right. Something you mentioned, whoops, must drop the precious book. Um, something that you mentioned <clears throat> when we were, um, when you were discussing his paintings is that he loved to drive around in his car and he had um, large canvases rolled up on his, and put on the top of the car, which is a fantastic image. But also something that you discuss, um, and there are photographs in this marvelous book, which I keep referring to, is that he would tack his um, canvases to the wall. Can you say a bit more, what, where were they, and did he put them in conjunction with other works? I think that's fascinating for people today as it must have been at the time. Sure, sure. Uh, it, if, you, um, if you look at some of the, there are some photographs that show the studio wall, um, and you see all of these different canvases tacked up, um, and in, in such a way that, you know, unlike Matisse, who would have had a predefined size right. canvas um, and work, worked from, the, from, from a predefined idea of, of the, the, the parameters, Bonar liked to keep open the size, the ultimate yeah. size that this work right. may ultimately unfold to being. And, um, and that really was very unique yeah. um, and, um, and gave him a lot of freedom. And like you said, because it also allowed him the portability of <laughs> moving them freely between um, places. Um, so I think that that, um, you know, that idea too that you know he he talks about art um, floats between intimism and decoration. That art's a part of everyday life, and that came from his early days. So I think the idea of um, of keeping keeping the work fluid a bit um, and and seeing it on the walls right. um, in its purest form was right. was something very uh, appealing. One of the things that. <clears throat> Um, uh, in that process, um, especially when you spoke about the the one of the I think it's um, in the bathroom, um, the bathtub, is that he painted it over a period of time. Does this help explain that he might have put it up or moved it around or you know it's tacked on the wall? So the next question is, um, when did he have them stretched or place them on stretchers? When did that happen? Well, that would have happened when he was ready to actually part with them <laughs> and have his dealers, um, or if he had a commission. You know, um, sometimes he also um, receives commissions for work. So, um, so I think he, you know, he kept it open as long as he possibly could. Um, in terms of there's certain works that he also I think felt were so personal. Yes. So the ones he chose to hold on to. Right. Um, till the end of his life. There's, a, there's another painting we didn't look at with René Monchati, right. um, the woman who was his lover in the 20s and, and um, who committed suicide after he married Mart. Um, that painting he began, you know, in the 20s, yeah. and he held on to until his death, right. which is a pretty long period of time. And I think in part, too, though, there, there are pictures that when he came to the Phillips, he saw one of the paintings here at the Phillips in 1926, um, and he asked if Marjorie had paint so that he could touch it up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a fun story, and Marjorie pretended she didn't have any paints on hand. Right. right. Oh, well, we had um, uh, one of the questions that has come in on the Q&A site is, um, what are the precise titles of the works that we just concentrated on, that we looked through. So the very first one is the Terrace. Terrace. Um, the second one is Twilight, um, Game of Croquet. And then the third one is the Open Window um, in the Phillips Collection. Then we looked at the Nude in Bathtub, um, and then the Bathroom. For anybody who has the catalog, um, I can tell you the first one was catalog 18, the second one catalog 10, the next one 24, and, and then we looked at 67 and 63. So we really did get um, a selection. Um, we are now, here's another um, question um, uh, from someone. Um, I once, uh, it's a little longer, I once saw a Bonard painting with very tall flowers 
and a little child walking on a pebbly path. I told myself I wanted a garden like that, and I have one now. The milkweed grew over my head, it bloomed, and I could hear the buzzing life of the bees going to the flowers. I have a wild native garden, thanks to Bonar, who permitted me to imagine. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that thank comment. Thank you. Um, you partly answered the question, but I think we need to ask it again. Why did Bonar include these ethereal, blurred figures in his work, such as, I don't know, she's not as blurred as some, mm -hmm. but why do you think that is? A couple of reasons. Um, one of the things that um, Bonar talked about was how he wanted to capture the feeling one has when you first come into a room and you see everything all at once. Uh -huh. and, and if you think about it, you know, sort of that, that, that idea in, in its essence is sort of before everything's become crystal clear, right? right? Because when you first come into a room and, you know, before your eyes have had the moment to adjust and take it in, right. there is a sense, you know, that, that you know, if, if you really are thinking about um, that all over quality of, in the compositions and the way I was talking about, then you give yourself a moment and you focus in and you begin to make out certain aspects. The second quality I would bring up is that for Bonar, um, the idea of the pictures are filtered through a dream. Say that again, it's so beautiful. The <laughs> ideas of the pictures that, you know, the, 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 the origin of them are filtered through a, a, a dream. And by that I mean Bonar's process was to go out into nature or take a moment, quiet moment, and observe the, the you know, interior uh, moments of his everyday life inside, um, make little sketches, and he, he was prolific in all the little sketches that he made. Um, and after that, he would then take a moment back in his studio, um, and in his words, I, before I paint, I think I dream. And I feel as though, again, when we all try to think back about our memories and our dreams, you know, they're often fuzzy around the edges. Oh, interesting. And so um, that's another way that I feel like there's um, perhaps, a, you know, um, an aspect um, that he brings in. Um, I think that the, they, they're, they, that allows them to have, a, you know, in a sense, um, a poetry, mm -hmm. in my view. And, and he was also illustrating poetry yeah. <laughs> um, during his time because there were just, there's something very evocative. It's not so, you know, everything isn't spelled out. Right. Um, they, he leaves a lot open, and that's even what... Um, the, con the contemporary artist Peter Doig says, too, mm -hmm. what he loved about Bonar, and so, you know, does, is that they, there is an openness. They allow us to kind of complete and imagine what really is going on and become a part of the work and bring our own experiences to bear. You, you know, I mean, a lot of, of the aspects are very open-ended. Yes, yes. Um, I think one of the... Um, the uh, things that you just mentioned about him sketching and also um, other media that he worked in, illustration. Um, what, uh, could you talk a little bit more, because this is an exhibition of paintings, but if it were going to be comprehensive, would there be, well, there are two books, um, illustrated books that he illustrated, um, Paul Verlaine and so on, but also etching. And that is how the etching and sketching and painting, how in, in your sort of view of Bonard, do all of these techniques go together or are they different? So Michel Terras, his, his great nephew, um, did a book called Bonard from the Drawing to the Painting, uh, which is out of print but in libraries, and, and I recommend it. And um, his idea is that there, there is a thread there is a way that, you know, that, and also Bonar, the graphic artist, you know, the way he translates ideas across media yes. um, is, very, is very present. 
Um, we just chose, and you know, it's a different slice. I mean, Bonar is so prolific, and there's a lot one um, could select. Um, that this was a show designed to focus more on the paintings, but yeah. not because we think the other bodies of work are any less important. It was just, a, again, a decision right. to sort of use the paintings as a focus. Um, we did in the earlier Bonar show at the Phillips have as, um, Who work. was the curator of that show? And so Dr. <laughs> Dr. Elizabeth Hutton Turner curated the show, and I was um, so fortunate to be able to be the assistant curator supporting that in collaboration with her. Um, and that exhibition, as I was saying, you know, had the screens, it had the sculpture, it had some photography. We didn't talk about the fact that Bonar also has some photo photography in his practice. Not that he saw it as something that he would have considered a finished artwork, right. but it was a very important part of his process. And they're really fascinating to see in light of the works um, that we're looking at here. And in the book for the exhibition, um, that there are some photographs. Um, I just want to say we have another question that's come in. Um, in the painting called The Palm, there seems to be a sharp contrast between the vibrant colors, orange, green, white, light blue, of the buildings and plants, and the cooler violet, um, almost depressive face of Macht. Do you also see this contrast? If so, how do you read it? Well, I think we got a little of your answer, but go on more. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. He does a really um, beautiful job of looking at the full chromatic range from the cooler to the warmer tones. But Bonar's approach to color is, is not theoretical. I, I have to say that. Um, and what he kind of does, which is interesting, is often as we were looking even at the open window, um, or even in the palm, the violets become um, shown in the, at the lower uh, portion of the painting with the figure, and then they recur in the sky. So I think color draws your eye through the composition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's one way where you see that. There's like a lyrical quality and I think he's aware of the, again, the way that the, the, the colors um, encapsulate a certain, uh, if it's warm, a certain kind of feeling and mood. Um, but he does do a really nice job um, in, in the way that you're seeing that, absolutely. The, or, the, those warm, you know, burnt oranges and those violets, and then, you know, within that, um, you know, bringing in the yellows and the, um, greens, the, the full intense chromatic range um, that, that Bonar just skillfully um, you know, uses to great, great effect. Well, you answered one of the questions we've had in, and that is, so is there a darker side to some of these paintings? And I think you've answered that a couple of times, but um, uh, one of the issues um, that someone asked, are there any of the sketches in the um, exhibit? And so I think you answered that we, not in this exhibition. Um, and when you say, did he paint portraits? Well, one room we didn't go into are self-portraits. Um, and it's a very small but really intense room that you are there with three painted Bonars. Um, and uh, uh, I would like to ask, I mean, you mentioned Peter Doig. You mentioned uh, Jennifer Bartlett. And in the um, uh, one last question from our um, an anonymous attendee is, who is another contemporary artist most influenced by Bonar? Ah, um, I was just actually there. There are quite a few. There are quite a few um, who who are who probably would call him an, an important influence. I mean. Um, Eric Fischel is one of the artists um, who comes to mind. Um, and I mean, there was a whole show that was at Jill Newhouse Gallery called Bonar and Friends that um, Karen Wilkin put together. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of artists that she gathered um, and that is, that is available. And, and so, I mean, there's so many artists. I mean, that's, he, I think that, that, you know, that's one of the things I think that's a true testament to right. an artist who stands the test of time, Absolutely. who is such an inspiration. Yes, when we think that this is 2024 and that we have um, examples in this exhibition 
um, from 100 years ago, and the freshness is remarkable. But we have just a couple of um, minutes left, and um, I would like to say this exhibition is such a modern muse museum exhibition. Whether it is going to, and I highly recommend the website, there is a link so that some of the recordings that Elsa made about other paintings is available there through SoundCloud. And I'd like to say also is it's up to date with programs and there's a huge variety. Um, this is for people who come here to the exhibition, they can pick up a little booklet and people are very careful to use it and then return it back to the um, uh, folder. But I also wanted to say one last thing about the book, which I'm not caught on the catalog, because it does have a catalog in the back, many of the, or most of the catalog entries made by um, George Shackelford um, at Fort Worth. But also there is, um, from Elsa, two very, I mean, we have two very important essays. One of them is Bonar and America, because mm -hmm. that's a slightly different story, when he gets going here, and which exhibitions were they, and then also a timeline. So whatever you know about French culture and, and the arts, you really feel it in there. And we even learn that um, she's so careful. She tell, told us what kind of Renault he was driving and that he painted it yellow. So on the note of yellow, so the yellow time, right? I want to thank you so much, um, Elsa. That was just a marvelous tour. And um, I know we'll all be back many times. Um, we have a couple of minutes left. And um, I'd like to ask you, in that short time, um, if when you start, when you started working on this, and what, what year? Uh, somewhere in the pandemic, it's all a blur. But a couple a of years ago, yes, a couple of years. Because George Shackelford um, made a statement because a very important picture from Fort Worth. The first on your right, as you enter the exhibition, they bought um, a Fort Worth. It's nine feet across and a huge view. And that got him a specialist in 19th century French art to think about this. And then how could you do a show on Bonar in America without immediately involving um, the Phillips? And that's where um, this marvelous uh, exhibition grew. I think it's important for the audience to know just how many people are involved. And if I could, I would take my camera and go like this because we have three people from the French embassy, an intern, um, as well as the, um, the adjoint for the cultural attaché, the team that is working on the timing and the filming, uh, Ashley Whitfield, who has been the coordinator for this. I wish I had everybody's names, um, but I do want to say this is really a team effort. And we had security guards who are here as well. And uh, so I don't have my camera. I'd love to say that because Bonar would have loved it. Loved <laughs> Thank you so much. Indeed. Thank, Thank you. you. Pardon? Oh, sorry. The most important thing. I, I, um, Eric is, Eric is managing me. I made sure I wanted everybody to know when the show, how long it goes on. You can visit this up through June 2nd. So you've got a couple of months, and that means you can come many times as well. So um, please do, and you will um, truly enjoy these, these works that you've now gotten to go. Thank you. Is that the better goodbye? <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you, Elsa. Yeah.